uh, she's going to be talking about uh, stable solutions to some elliptic equations. So, thank you. Okay, thank you, Hernan, for the introduction. Also, thank you, Leandro and Schwaum, for this invitation for, to participate in this really nice Congress or virtual meeting. Uh, well, I hope everyone is safe. And it's also the first time I'm having a talk <laughs> through Zoom, although I am teaching, but it's not the same teaching calculus as giving a talk. So I hope this turns out to be okay. Um, so I am. I'm going to talk about uh, stable solutions to some elliptic equations. Uh, this is part of an ongoing project. Uh, some of the results have already been published a couple of years ago, but as I will mention, uh, there were some new developments uh, in the past few months, uh, so I decided to pick up the subject again. So um, I will begin with a motivation presenting, then I will present the equation with a gradient term. Actually, Professor Ireneo already presented it, but I will consider the, the weights differently. And then I will talk about the general case. Okay, so um, what we are interested in is uh, the non-variational equation of this form. So it's the Laplacian of U, and uh, we consider a gradient term with some weight and it's equal to a reaction term but see that the dependence here is crucial so the the weight depends on x and the uh, reaction term depends on u we consider this um, problem in a bounded domain and uh, g is a given non-linearity lambda is a non-negative parameter, and this function b is uh, at least bounded, and we will uh, ask uh, more for g as, uh, as the computations develop. Okay, so uh, this was already mentioned by Professor Irineo, but I will just uh, quickly uh, run through it again. If this uh, coefficient or this weight here is a constant and, and it's positive, then you can view this equation as the stationary part of this parabolic equation, which is in turn can be interpreted as a viscosity approximation of the hamilton jacobi equations. Um, so this can be some sort of motivation. Um, there are uh, several results by Professor Ireneo and different collaborators for the case, the, the reverse case, right? So you take the reaction depending on X and you take the weight depending on U and you have uh, existence and non-uniqueness of solutions and infinite solutions actually. So these are very interesting uh, works. But I will consider uh, the other way around. So B depending on X and G depending on U. So what is the motivation for this? So if B is um, a constant function, so if you perform the Hopf-Call transformation and you take this function V, um, which is exponential of B U, remember that B I'm thinking in constant here, then uh, from the equation for U, you can write an equation for V, which is very simple. It's just the, the typical semilinear equation. And this F is a nonlinearity that depends on G. So I will always use this notation. So uh, let me go back. Uh, U will be always a solution of the non-variational equation like this with a gradient term. G will always be the right-hand side for the equation for U. And uh, if I perform a hopf call transformation, then I will obtain a variational equation, which I will always denote with the uh, letter V for the variable, and the nonlinearity will be F, okay? I will always use this. Okay, so uh, of course this is a classical equation and there are various results um, and the classical existence result considers functions f uh, that satisfy some properties. So this, uh, the, the usual ones are considering f to be a C1 nonlinearity, convex, non-decreasing, positive at zero. This will help building up a subsolution. So zero is a subsolution and uh, superlinear uh, at infinity. So for, I will call this condition two on f, 
So when I mention condition two, this is what I'm, I will be thinking of. And so uh, since uh, work from the 70s from Kranda Rabinovich, we have that there is, exists um, a finite extremal parameter lambda star such that if the parameter lambda is bigger than this lambda star, then there is no bounded solution. On the contrary, if lambda is between zero and lambda star, there exist bounded minimal solutions, minimal in the sense that it's smallest, and also these solutions are stable. I will recall what stable means in a second. And uh, the question is what happens when lambda equals lambda star? So you can compute uh, a limiting solution, V star, which will be the limit of the solutions uh, that correspond to each lambda when lambda tends to lambda star. And you can prove that this is a weak solution, but the question is, is it bounded? Okay, so um, so if the, when the solutions exist for the lambdas that we can actually um, uh, establish that there exists a solution, these are solutions are stable. So this motivates the study of stable solutions. And um, if we have stable solutions and we are able to compute uniform L infinity bounds for all stable solutions, then we also get uniform bounds for all minimal solutions given this um, correspondence. And if, if these are uniform, I mean uniform in lambda, then this would be a um, sufficient condition for the uh, um, extremal solution V star to also be in L infinity. Okay, so uh, let's recall a little bit what we think or, or what we call a stable solution. So uh, if we go back to the equation for V, this is a very simple equation, and it can be thought of the Euler-Lagrange equation associated to, to the energy functional. Um, but uh, this energy, uh, well, it can easily be seen that it does not admit an absolute minimizer. But it does admit local minimizers, or sometimes called global minimizers, which just means that they are minimizing with, uh, um, with respect to perturbations that have the same um, value at the boundary. So it does not admit uh, absolute minimizers, but it does have some sort of local minimizers that turn out to be stable in the sense that they uh, make the, this quadratic form non-negative. The scoratic form depends on the energy, right? So this is what we call a stable solution in the variational uh, setting. And um, this is equivalent to saying that the first eigenvalue of the linearized problem is non-negative. Uh, so, well, it could be uh, defined as semi-stable for non-negative and stable for strictly positive. Let's not go into that right now. Uh, and another equivalent um, equivalent definition, which is the one that is uh, going to be interesting interesting for us, is that um, if V is bounded, um, I can also characterize it uh, the, its stability by saying that there exists a positive function psi psi that um, satisfies the oh sorry. It should be psi here. Okay, so it's the Laplacian of psi bigger or equal uh, than f prime of v psi. Oh, I, I'm sorry for this. Okay, um, and as I said before, local global the dash is because it depends on which references you're reading. So it just means that minimizers with respect to small perturbations with same boundary values are stable. So this is why it's interesting to consider stable solutions. Okay, so for general domains, uh, Kranda Rabinovich from the 70s and also Mignon and Puel gave sufficient conditions for this extremal solution to be classical, so bounded and smooth and therefore a classical, whenever f, so the right-hand side, is of exponential or power-like uh, term and n is less or equal to 9. So there is a dimension um, issue here also. Um, in more general settings, there are some partial results regarding the boundedness of stable solutions. Uh, these have been gone for the last 25 years. There are 
they having always partial. So if F satisfies uh, condition two was a condition on F, so convex, non-decreasing, positive at zero, and superlinear at infinity, and any bounded domain omega, and dimensionless or equal to N3, that have proved the um, uh, boundedness for stable solutions. And then if you just stick with the ball and dimension is less uh, than nine for any F, not just satisfying two, but any F, Cabre and Capella uh, prove the same result. Then later, also Xavier Cabre for any F, but if you take a convex domain and N less or equal than four, and then a couple of years later, Vichegas proved any, any, for n equals four and f satisfying the previous condition. So I, I, I make more restrictions on f, but now I allow any domain. So it, it was able to prove the boundedness for solutions. And then um, uh, let's say in a couple of, last couple of years, there have been more results or stronger results <clears throat> Sorry. So for n less or equal than seven and f satisfying two and omega convex plus some extra condition on omega, Xavier Cabré and Rosoton also prove the boundedness. And then for n equals five, extra conditions on f and any domain, uh, the same result was proven by Xavier Cabré, Miguel San, uh, Manet Sanchon, and Sprack. So I'm I'm just saying this to see to so that you can see that this has been quite difficult to achieve um, because uh, when you give more conditions on, when you uh, restrict F, then you're allowed to take more general omegas and the other way around. So this was a, uh, an open question for some time. And uh, last year, uh, Cabri, Figali, Rosoton and Serra proved um, the, the full result. So for n less or equal to nine, and f any non-decreasing convex and superlinear at infinity non-negative function, and any uh, domain uh, omega. So you get the boundedness for the stable solutions. So let me just tell you why this dimension is important. It is important because if you take dimension at least 10, you can find singular stable solutions, as simple as the one that's here. Um, and there is also a connection to stable minimal surfaces, um, which we will not cover at this moment. Okay, so what can be said for you? What can we say for you? So this was all for V, and what can be said for the function U, which was the solution for this uh, equation with the gradient term. Can we recover some of these results even if P is not constant? So because if the, the B was constant, then we could hop call it <laughs> transformation and, and make a transformation and reach the, the usual classical equation. But what if B is not constant? And if B is not constant, what is the meaning of stability? Okay, so let's recall the equation. And uh, this was the same equation as before. So, but this problem in general, if B is not constant, is not variational. So we need a suitable definition of stable solution. And what would that be? Because we don't have an energy functional anymore. So we will, um, we will take the, the third equivalent definition. So for variational problems, there were three equivalent definitions. It was the uh, non-negativity of the quadratic form, something related to the, fr the first eigenvalue of the linearized problem. And then there was something related to the existence of a positive um, uh, sort of eigenfunction for the linearized problem. And this is the, the one that we are going to to uh, use to define stability for non-variational problems. So we were calling a solution stable to this non-variational problem if there exists a positive function phi such that then we linearize this problem and uh, we get this inequality. Okay, so if B is constant, then this makes sense because the existence of such phi is equivalent to the existence of a psi, which of course will be um, will be found using a Hopkel type transformation, which satisfies the inequality for um, 
V. And here again, it's the typo, I'm sorry. <laughs> it was copy paste problem. And this is equivalent to the stability of V. And of course, the equation for V is variation. Okay, so um, the first thing that we can do is think what happens when the right-hand side of the non-variational problem, so the function G, is of exponential type, right? Because this historically was the first um, uh, right hand side considered for the equation for the variational problem. So we're considering G of U to be of some exponential type. And um, just recall that if you take uh, G of exponential type for the, for the solution for the problem for U, and if B is constant, what would be the uh, related nonlinearity F for the variational problem would be the, a power like. Right? So if we take for the equation on the non-variational side an exponential function, g, then this will lead to a power-like uh, uh, nonlinearity on the variational setting, which we already know how it works, because this was one a part of the classical results. Okay, so um, what would be the, the result that you can prove? So if you uh, start with a constant function b and you take a positive classical stable solution to the non-variational problem then you get a bound a bound for you if something happens to the dimension it's either less or equal than 10 or it's between 10 and this number that is related to beta where beta is the coefficient of this exponential type okay so let's just um take some explicit examples, if beta is equal to one and b is actually the, uh, equal to one, then the equation for you, the, no, the non-variational equation, becomes this very simple one. And uh, stable solutions for this equation satisfy that u is in L infinity if n is like less or equal than 15, which coincides with the classical result. And the other, um, the other result that you can have is if you have beta equals to one, but b tending to zero, so you have no gradient term, then you get the classical equation. And this result here, if you substitute b and beta for this uh, beta equals one and b tending to zero, then you recover the classical result of Crandall Rabinovich. So you, uh, you get that um, u is bounded if dimension is less or equal than nine. It's also very interesting to see that this equation with no gradient term has less regularity than the previous one, which was uh, bounded for n less or equal than 15. Okay, uh, so uh, there are two ways of achieving this proposition. Uh, one is, of course, using the Hopfkel transformation and going back to the, um, to the classical problem. But the idea is to try to prove it directly uh, because then you want to prove the same sort of result if B is no longer constant. I will not bother you with this computation right now. I will mention some of the ideas uh, later on. Okay, so what happens for uh, general B? Uh, so if I have a function B, uh, and you a positive solution to this equation, then uh, let's say that B has oscillates between uh, underline B and overline B, uh, just to, uh, to keep in mind that B is bounded and it's between these two values and these uh, numbers will be extremely useful in a while. So you can prove the uh, same uh, type of result but um, as I will show you later with the uh, computations for general G, uh, you have to control this oscillation. So this is not true for, for any B, of course. And um, the result that you can find is that the exponential of U, exponential of U is the right-hand side, is in, uh, in LQ for Q less than some constant that depends on the oscillation of B and these two parameters, eta and delta that I will mention in a while, but this is actually technical uh, and come from the stability condition on the non-variational problem. 
And uh, this relies, this result relies on a technical lemma that it basically is controlling the gradient times uh, exponential type functions. Um, and so uh, you can control this by some, again, an exponential type function and some, let's call it lower terms. So exponentials of a lower exponent that you can actually put inside the other ones and, um, and use it to be bounded. But you can see, as you can see, uh, this uh, technical result, which is crucial for the proposition, uses strongly that the exponential function is equal to its derivative. So um, it really depends on properties of the exponential function. And that is not good if I want to, uh, to, 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 to perform the same uh, proposition for general G. Uh, in any case, uh, it allow us, if I also assume that B is positive, it allow us to reach an L-infinity result uh, using the previous proposition. So you can actually have um, an L-infinity result uh, with a very nice argument. So if you take the half call transformation, but uh, for uh, B overline, so this would be the, uh, uh, like the maximum of this function b, then this v is actually a positive subsolution to this problem here. And uh, if you take a solution w to this same equation, then you get that uh, using the maximum principle, v would be less than w. And if v is less than w, then you can use a bootstrap argument. So you you suppose B is in some LS, and then this would give you, if you have W here, this would give you some um, W2S over this exponent for W, and then you plug it in again, and you finally um, get this, uh, this bound for some dimensions. Of course, this, uh, this uh, really strange looking number for the dimension, this restriction on the dimension comes from the previous proposition and this bootstrap argument. Okay, uh, what about uh, what happens for more general functions G? What can you say for uh, more general functions G? So the first result uh, should concern existence. Uh, I haven't said anything about that. Excuse me. Okay, so uh, if B is uh, positive, and let's assume it's a C alpha function defined in a smooth boundary domain, bounded domain, sorry, and G is a non-decreasing C1 function, and let's assume for G the same things that we assume for or that were assumed uh, for F in the uh, classical existence result, then uh, it is possible to establish the same type of result. There is an extremal parameter such that if lambda is bigger than this parameter, then there is no classical solution. And if lambda is less than this extremal parameter, there exists a minimal classical solution, minimal in the sense of smallest. And, um, and moreover, if we restrict to the case where G is the exponential type, is of the exponential type, then the L infinity estimates that we established before apply to the extremal solution U. But up to now, only only in this situation, right? Okay, the the proof is quite simple. Um, is since B is positive or non-negative, then uh, U is actually a super solution of this uh, variational equation, classical equation. And also since G at zero is positive, then zero is a strict sub-solution. So we have a super solution and a sub-solution. So there exists a classical solution corresponding to lambda between zero and this U for this equation for this variational equation, this classical equation, but this is not possible for a lambda because of the classical existence result, so there must exist an extremal parameter. How to find this extremal parameter? So we have to find or construct a solution for a specific lambda, and this is done by monotone iteration. So you form an increasing sequence, um, starting with the solution zero, and then uh, each solution, uh, u sub m, 
solves this equation with the right hand side fixed so this no longer depends on um, u sub m and this is uh, you can prove using uh, maximum principle that uh, this uh, this is an increasing solution and uh, this uh, these are bounded by this um, super solution that corresponds to the right hand side being equal to one and it is a super solution for small lambda so for lambda that satisfies this condition here and this is the restriction that we have on lambda star okay um so you just take limits and prove that u sub lambda is a solution so it's uh fairly nice okay so uh now there, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, last year there was uh, this beautiful paper by Cabré, Figali, Rosoton, and Serra, uh, where they proved this uh, conjecture on the boundedness of stable solutions, at least for a dimension less or equal than nine. Um, and so uh, it is interesting now to go back to this uh, non variational problem and uh, try to prove a more general result. Uh, I should also mention that the last couple of days, Cabré and, and Manil Sanchon and someone else that I can't remember, posted uh, a similar result for the P-Laplacian equation, so the um, boundedness of stable solutions. And um, there's um, a forthcoming paper by Cabré and other collaborators on the fractional uh, Laplacian stable solution. So I know most of you here are interested in this type of equations. So just uh, keep this in mind. I would just like to recall another classical result for stable solutions. Uh, this famous theorem by Sternberg and Sumbrun. Not quite sure how to read this. Um, and it just basically it refers, of course, to the classical semilinear problem, and it says that if v is a C1 nonlinearity and omega is a smooth bounded domain, and you take a smooth stable solution, then um, then there is this uh, inequality. Sorry, there should be here an eta squared. Sorry, here should be an eta squared. So we'll wait here, eta squared for this perturbation and here on the left hand side what you can see is that um, well first of all you consider only regular points and then uh, this um, um, derivative or gradient with this letter t is just the tangential gradient so the um, the full gradient minus the projection onto the normal of the level sets of u and uh, this a square here represents the um, the second fundamental form or the sum of the principal uh, curvatures so this is uh, this also relies on a, on a, on an uh, a result by the same authors that relates this uh, this sum to something that we encounter when we take the when we consider the solution v, which corresponds basically to the trace of the Hessian and something that looks like the uh, infinity Laplacian. And this is uh, used strongly on the papers by Cabré, uh, both on the um, on this um, classical case and also for the Pilaplacian case because there is a similar result like this one but for the Pilaplash equation it's done by uh, Farina and Valdinocci and it of course it reads differently there is some uh, weight here with the gradient p gradient of u to the power p minus two um, well, it would be very nice to reach a result like this for this uh, non-variational equation. Uh, it have been quite hard so far. So, of course, we can uh, use again the Hopfkoll transformation uh, to get some insight. And if uh, and this would lead us, I mean, if B would be constant, of course, we could perform the same method and reach that u would be bounded and then go back. But um, we cannot do this for general b, so we just use this for some insight. And what, what is the, 
what is the approach? The approach is that uh, since now G of U is uh, more general, is not of exponential type, so I have to be careful because G does not uh, relate to G prime, which would happen for the exponential type problem that I mentioned earlier. So now I have to make G prime appear. So the idea for this is that you just consider the equation for U and you differentiate to respect to the coordinate I then uh, you multiply by this term here and you see that here we have this exponential type which is the um, which is like a perturbation that we need in order to uh, compare with this term b here i mean if we didn't have the gradient term then we wouldn't have this exponential here you sum over i and integrate and you obtain this um, this nice equality here um, and uh, now this right hand side depends on g prime of u and times some positive uh, quantity that depends on this psi which is a test function uh, exponential function and the gradient square now we we know how to compare g prime i mean we have seen this something like lambda g prime and this was exactly uh, part of the stability condition for u or the non-variational problem so uh recalling this that the right hand side involves g prime as the condition for the stability for u so we multiply the stability condition by exactly this term but divided by phi phi was the uh, positive function that existed from the stability so if it was a strictly positive so you can divide by phi and uh, then you get that this the right hand side term from the previous um, uh, expression is actually bounded by uh, this other quantity where delta and eta are some uh, parameters that are, have to be chosen less or equal than one uh, this is because uh, when you plug this in at the in the um, stability condition, the stability condition for U involved the Laplacian of phi and uh, a, um, a condition on that involved the gradient of U and gradient of phi. So when you plug this in and integrate, then you get um, several terms that uh, are related to phi but we don't need phi, right? So five does not appear here. So we, just, we need to get rid of phi. And uh, in this setting where um, B is not constant, the only way to get rid of phi is to, to, to have like a Cauchy-Schwarz or Holder inequalities with weights. And this is this delta and eta parameters here that you find. Of course, if uh, B, um, super B and uh, lower b are equal to each other and this means that b is constant function then this term disappear so you can just take delta tending to one eta equals to zero and um, and you get the um, a weighted version of the Sternberg Sumerum inequality. Also a nice ingredient is that uh, if you use that G is uh, non-negative, this is a condition that we have to use strongly, then uh, you can actually bound the Laplacian of U by this quantity and then you can express mixing the two inequalities that I've shown before, you can express this as this uh, full inequality and uh, this kind of looks like the sternberg zumberg um, quantity. So uh, we could rewrite this. If there was no term here, if this delta wasn't here, we could actually make make it appear as the sternberg zumberg inequality, but we still have this extra term here that we have to uh, be careful of. So uh, if B is constant, then this disappears. So we just have the uh, usual inequality. But if B is not constant, then uh, this term here does not vanish. And also, uh, this here is is not the Sternberg-Zumbram inequality because this coefficient would not be one. Um, so there, uh, an idea is that instead of 
pursuing the boundedness of view uh, and following the results that we mentioned before that was um, if we remember there was um, a proof of uh, boundedness or that the exponential of u belong to some space lq and then by uh, bootstrap argument that we, we could reach the boundedness of u then the idea was uh, is to do exactly the same thing here so instead of searching to bound u uh, considering uh, exponential of uh, over b u uh, to be um, uh, to reach the same goal so uh, then it's true if you just consider this uh, if I mean you reread the, 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 the previous inequality but considering or trying to write this in terms of the exponential function just because well if you take okay I, I didn't write this to make, to make make it messy but if you take the derivative of this exponential function then you get the or the gradient of this then you get the gradient of u times against the exponential so it basically you're always uh, reading the gradient of u at some point and also the regular points are the points where u is also regular so uh, it's just a, another way to interpret this inequality and with that in mind then it was possible to prove the first step of the um, say the method uh, for the gradient of the exponential now um, the idea would be now to well it would be nice to get a, a an inequality like this uh, I have I haven't been able to to prove it so far and um, then try to follow the program and prove that actually u is bounded at least for some dimensions and some considerations for omega so I guess I was a bit too fast but thank you for listening gracias muito obrigado okay thank you so much uh, Joanna for this beautiful talk. Uh, I don't know if we have any questions. Someone from the audience wants to ask Joanna some questions. I have a question. Uh, okay. Very nice talk, Joanna. Thank you, Joe. Uh, what happens in the subquadratic and superquadratic regime on the gradient vari variable? Uh, you, you mean if you take other other uh, exponents for the gradient? Yeah, not a quadratic power, but a subquadratic or a superquadratic one. Oh, I don't know. I haven't I haven't studied those problems. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, this was just motivated because uh, if B is constant, then you reach a classical problem. So the first perturbation of this problem would be just to take a weight that is not constant. Uh, so I'm, I really, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Okay, thank you, Joanna. Sorry. <laughs> and I have a question too, but I mean, I hope I'm not going too far off the tangent, but can you, I mean, do you think there is any hope that you can do some sort of argument for a quasi-linear equation? So instead of minimizing gradius square minus blah, 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 just some convex function of the gradient of u or something like that, or is, or is it dreaming too far? Uh, you mean replacing the energy by something else? Yes, exactly. Like here, uh, here, minimizing yes, so something the, else. Exactly. So an, yes. a, a different definition for stability, but okay. So, but what would be the energy? I mean, this is associated with the uh, the equation. I would say, uh, how do you? We have to relate. Yeah. So, if, if, in, if this gives you the Laplacian, right? The Gradius right. square when you take the the Euler Lagrange. But in general, you can have sort of like an F that is convex, and then you would get a quasi-linear equation. But maybe there is. I mean, maybe it's not like trivial at all to adapt the method? Well, uh, that is a really nice question. Uh, 
I, I don't know, but I, I would assume that it could be interesting to, to try and check it out because uh, one of the things that makes it so hard with this definition of stability is that this phi function that I have to get rid of, right? Because it's some kind of strategy to prove. So uh, trying to get rid of phi is, is the biggest problem of the computations. And mm -hmm. um, that's why we always have to have this eta and delta parameters. If you have another energy uh, or sort of energy, then uh, I'm guessing it would be it would be a nice starting place. It's like for the Pila Plushen, they have another stability yeah. condition that doesn't look look like this, and mm -hmm. and it's possible to to have the result. Well, I'll, I'll think about it. Thank you, Anna. Mm -hmm. That's a very nice suggestion. Sure, thank you. Uh, and I think we have another question. I, I saw a raising hand here, uh, Fiorella. Is it? Okay, I don't know. I, I got a, a little sign that said that, that someone was raising her hand, but... Maybe, maybe it was, was a mistake. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so let's uh, thank Shauna again for her beautiful thank talk. You. Thank you.